Hi, thanks for tuning in to QRP to QRO. This is video number 15. My name is Steve, and some of you may know that I did a bicycle trip up to Lake Erie from the Columbus area. And that's most of what this video is. I don't know exactly what I'm going to title it as, but of course, uh, whatever it shows up as you guys are seeing right now is what I came up with. So most of this video is uh, going to be going over gear and equipment. That's been one of the common questions I've had, uh, both on the trail and uh, also in some of the forums I've posted on. So as you guys see, there is uh, a lot of stuff and uh, it does actually all fit on the bike. So I'll do that here uh, in the beginning of the video. And then what I'm going to do is break down the equipment. Um, it's not necessarily that, you know, I have things organized. Uh, a lot of it is just kind of hodgepodged in different bags. So I'm not going to open up a bag and then show you exactly what's in the bag. It's going to be segmented like uh, I'll have an electronics section, uh, shelters, cooking equipment, uh, clothing. You know, I'll, I'll break it down into smaller sections, I guess, and then kind of group everything that, uh, that is part of that in with what that section is. Uh, once I get all the equipment on the bike, actually I'll, uh, I'll speed that up a little bit so it's uh, faster in the playback. But uh, I'll put all the gear on the bike in the beginning and then I'll take the camera up closer because there's some tidbits I want to show you guys, uh, tips and tricks as to how to lash things on if you need to. Uh, like for example, the, the extra bags, not the panniers, but the uh, extra bags that you guys will see. Uh, that go on the front. I have those suspended weight-wise uh, by the second stem that's on the uh, on the handlebar, I guess. So it's not that the, the weight is supported by the pannier. It's more like the pannier is stabilizing it. But I'll show you guys that here in a little bit. So uh, with that, let me go ahead and start loading up the bike and we'll speed it up and go from there. have it, the loaded bike. All right, now we'll do a close-up of a couple things. So first up is the lashing and support of the uh, extra bags, like this green one on the outside. Move that bottle out of the way and see if we can get up in there. Uh, actually, I'll point that out first. I know I mentioned this in a, a previous video, uh, but I've got a second stem on here. So if you look at the steer tube, you can see how tall that is with all the spacers in it. So this is the stem for the actual handlebar up here. But uh, I put a second one on and then this uh, this dummy bar that the bell is attached to. My end bell works. Actually sounds pretty good. But uh, that second bar on there makes it fantastic for holding the handlebar bag, uh, the bell, all my accessories so it just uh, it keeps the top bar uh, clear for the GPS and my hands but uh, what I did if you can see down in there I've got the 550 cord tied around it and then let me see if I can do this that comes down and then ties on to uh, the top of this bag and these are all roll top uh, dry sacks uh, these are this green one and the yellow one, the small yellow one, are uh, backpacking type 
rice axe, and then the uh, big yellow ones on the back are kayaking style, so they're a lot more rugged than these uh, these thin ones. And speaking of uh, ruggedness, on my trip this buckle broke off. Well, the buckle itself didn't break, but the, the attachment there to the uh, other side of the roll top tore off. So I've just got a piece of 550 cord that's rolled up in there. It actually works out all right. So that's what's uh, supporting the weight of the bag. And then down here, I've got another uh, piece of 550 cord that's just wrapped around the two, the pannier and the green bag. And that's uh, kind of like a, a trucker's hitch, if you will. So I've got a, a loop on this side, and then uh, I can tension it with uh, you know running the, the line through the loop and then pulling on it. You probably see me doing that a little bit in the, uh, the sped up portion of the video. But uh, it actually works all right. It, uh, it keeps everything stable and uh, it's not swinging around too much. Let's move around to the other side. I know the lighting's probably not quite as good on this side, but uh, I've got the same thing going on. Of course, the bag is shorter, so I've got a longer piece of uh, 550 cord there. And then you can see my securement uh, flashing there. And same thing. I mean, that's. Yeah, it's a, a little bit loose, but it uh, it doesn't swing around and mess up the balance of the ride at all. So we'll go up to the handlebar and I'll show you the, the business end here of the electronics. Oh, another thing too, I put this mirror on uh, before the trip also. And uh, the one thing I don't like about it is uh, the width of the dummy bar down here is not wide enough. If you look at, well, I don't know if I can do this. I'll try and go around the other side. How about that? So from a riding perspective, I don't know if this is going to come out or not. But uh, if you're trying to see behind you on the road, all the stuff that's uh, thrown over the top of the gear in the back is interfering with the view of the mirror. So if I spaced that out another, uh, I don't know, eight or ten inches maybe, that would you know, get me uh, a lot more visibility off to the side. But I've got another idea for dealing with uh, the visibility too later on. But uh, as far as the electronics, I know that's one thing that a lot of people are always curious about. Uh, the two main things that I run are the tablet down here and uh, the Garmin bike computer, the Edge 1000. So those are my two primary uh, draws on the electrical system. Right now, the uh, yeah, that's at 100% right now, so... That's not really drawing a whole lot of juice, but the tablet is at, uh, what's that say, 34%. So that's uh, trying to charge as we speak. So we look at our power meter, uh, the battery voltage on the top left, got 13.29 uh, volts. We're drawing about 3.5 watts at the moment, and uh, 0.27 amps, 0.28 amps, so 280 milliamps. And then that uh, energy consumption is uh, watt hours, which is sort of an accumulation from my trip. Uh, that's not entirely accurate because uh, I did plug in any chance I got. So this is, uh, this is really the only uh, accumulation of uh, uh, just the electronics on the bike as I was rolling. It's not, uh, it's not accounting for the other plugged in. Uh, charging, so to speak. So I don't know, maybe add another uh, 200 or so watt hours to it, maybe. Just a guess. I'm not 100% uh, sure off the top of my head. So, and of course, the uh, two Nalgenes, I just got those suspended off the second stem there. And then uh, all the cabling going back to the battery. So this is the, the lead from the battery. I've got it 
stuffed in the pan here. I'll show you guys that uh, here in a bit. But um, I've got two different, I use power pole connectors for everything here. But I've got two different uh, plugs on this. Uh, let me set the phone down. There we go. Needed both my hands. Uh, but on each end, so these, these gray cables, uh, those are the ones that go up to the power meter. I'll show you guys that on the other side. There's the two. So you've got one that feeds in uh, for the supply, and then you've got one that feeds in for the load. And that's how you can measure through the meter what the power draw is and the, the amperage and, and the watt hours and, and so on and so forth. But uh, I've got two power pole connectors on each end here. Uh, so there's, okay, so that one that I'm connected to right there is the supply. And then uh, this one's the load. And again, I've got two sets of power poles. That way it gives me some plug options and interconnectability with a bunch of different things. So sometimes uh, what I do when I'm riding, and I'll show you that uh, here later on when I break down all the equipment, uh, but I do have solar panels. So I can plug in uh, a set of uh, solar panels there and charge on the go too if I want. Or the uh, adapter there, that's a four-way splitter. I got a couple of these, this style and then a, a four-way cross. But uh, those give me more plug-in options also, depending on what I'm uh, plugging in and what I'm trying to charge off of. And then, uh, again, this side is the load that goes to a 12-volt uh, uh, accessory plug or a cigarette-style lighter plug in a car. And then uh, there's a USB, 12-volt to USB adapter. Originally, what I used to use, and I did use this actually quite a bit on my trip too, so we can get in there. That's a 12-volt uh, accessory plug and a, a pair of USB uh, plugs also that's kind of integrated into the same thing but uh, what I've found is both of these actually that uh, that cube and then this uh, regular plug-in USB adapter uh, both of them interfere with the radio that's uh, that little guy there that's a Yesu VX6R and as you can see it says submersible right on it so both that and the uh, speaker mic are waterproof. So it makes it nice to ride in the rain. It doesn't matter if it gets wet, it just hangs out right there on the side of the bike. And there's the feed cable to the big antenna. I'll talk about uh, that in a little bit also. But when, uh, when I run these USB adapters, the uh, receive on that handheld radio goes to pot. I'm not sure exactly why, but it's uh, probably something just in the circuitry and how it's doing the voltage regulation down to uh, the 5 volt USB. But uh, anyway, that's uh, that's the power system. So, and again, anything that runs off a of USB, including uh, that light, the Sentinel, uh, I can recharge all that stuff off a of USB, which makes it really nice. Or if I want to run uh, something directly off the 12 volts, I've got uh, certainly that option, uh, that option as well. Like the charger for that light, that's a Phoenix, uh, what is it, a PD35, I think. But it's uh, a really, really super bright LED flashlight. It's my regular everyday carry, but uh, I've got the adapter, as you see. So I can attach it to the bike and use that as a headlight too. Works out pretty slick. Uses uh, 18650 style batteries, if you're familiar. The little, uh, well, I shouldn't say little lithiums, but they're big lithiums. The smaller ones are the CR, uh, what are they, CR123s or A123s, something like that. But an 18650 is like two of those stacked together. So it works out pretty good. Uh, we'll go over the, uh, the pump options on the bike, too, while I'm at it. So I've actually got two. That's the Bontrager Air Rush Road, which is a dual 
pump. So it's uh, just a regular hand pump. And then uh, of course the, the CO2 cartridge is there. You can, you can do both. Uh, but the one I just picked up is this, um, uh, what is it? Uh, the Turbo Morph Digital by, is that Topeak, I think? Topic? I forget how you pronounce it. Uh, but that is an absolutely fantastic uh, pump. It's got the digital gauge on it. And uh, I actually use this more than I do my regular uh, floor pump now. It's just convenient. It's always there on the bike, so it makes it uh, makes it really nice. I don't have any problems getting up over 80 PSI with it. So I'm sure you could uh, get up to some higher pressures, 100 PSI, 110 maybe, depending on what your tires take. Uh, and then just the the gear on the bike, I'll talk about the, the wire there later on. That's uh, a ham radio antenna. It's a jumper dipole. We've got uh, one spare tire here. It's just looped over itself. So it makes it more of a smaller package, but that's one of the original tires for the bike. It's got a wire bead on it, so you can't really fold it, but... If you uh, loop it like that, it doesn't uh, doesn't damage the bead too much. I could have tried to go for a third loop, make that even smaller, but uh, this seemed to seemed to work out okay. And it seemed like if it was going to go a little bit smaller with it, it'd be a little too stiff trying to wind that up. So I just left it at the two wraps. Talk about uh, the Nalgene for a minute. That's my uh, foam roller. So I've got uh, bad knees and on my brakes, you know, in between riding days, I uh, roll out my IT bands. So that's what that foam is on the outside. And my Cabela's uh, guide wear, rain wear. So I'll talk about, uh, I guess, more of the gear a little bit when I, when I break it down. Of course, uh, 550 cord for lashing things, that always comes in handy. Use it for ridge lines. The uh, bags on the outside, I've got a lot of my uh, lighter weight uh, food supplies in there. And then uh, these cleaner bags are just resupply stuff, uh, extra food and, and whatnot that I pick up. And then my snowshoeing boots that I've converted to uh, SPD clips. There's my hideous looking uh, zip tied on aluminum SPD clips, but as goofy as they look, they work fantastic. So we'll go ahead and uh, start breaking down equipment. So my gear talk won't be in really any particular order. I'm just gonna start off with shelter options. So the main shelter that I used for the particular trip was my tent, that's a mountain hardware Hammerhead too, and the uh, nice thing about it is it's got a fly on it that goes all the way down to the ground on all sides, so it's a nice stormproof tent. And uh, it also, if you know the difference between a three season and a four season tent, three season being uh, a lot more mesh inside, and a four season being more of a, a true double wall, uh, solid wall tent. Uh, this is a combination of a three and a four season. It has panels that you can zip in, and uh, it turns into a full solid wall, uh, solid double wall tent. So it keeps the heat in pretty well. But uh, that was my main shelter. I've also got my hammock. That's a, a war bonnet. And uh, actually, this is all kind of part of the same deal. But um, for some reason, my back didn't like the hammock too much, so I only use that a couple of nights if... Uh, if I needed a quick shelter to set up and take down real quick in the morning, then uh, the hammock was the, the better option for the speed. And uh, the under quilt for it, that's what this bag is. That's uh, made by Hammock Gear. That's a down under quilt. It's normally rated to 20 degrees Fahrenheit, I think. And uh, when I ordered it, I got uh, all the most overstuffing that they offered. So both the toe box and uh, the main body, the underquilt, which it's a full length. It's not uh, It's not a short one. It's a full length. But um, So I don't know exactly what the official 
temperature rating is uh, of it, but that in combination with my zero degree sleeping bag, um, I've actually camped down to about minus 10 with it, minus 10 Fahrenheit. I've been perfectly warm, so it, uh, it works out fine. And then uh, the tarp for the hammock that's in this bag, I kind of separated this out because it's almost its own uh, shelter option. Most of the time uh, on this particular trip, uh, I set it up as a cook shack and also a garage for the bike. I set the, uh, the bike in there at night, which is nice. A smaller bag off to the side that has uh, door panels in it. So you set the tarp up as like an A-frame with a ridge line, and then the uh, uh, the doors box in the the front and the back. Which uh, you know, if you've got a little bit of wind-driven rain, it's fine. Uh, but the the doors don't uh, seal against the tarp itself. It's just clipped on the top, and then down in each corner and then it's uh, it uses uh, what do they call that shock cord uh, to kind of pull the sides down on the edges so it doesn't really seal off uh, I mean if you get like a 30 mile an hour wind and rain it's going to blow through so there's really nothing stopping it but it's uh, it's better than nothing I guess but uh, yeah most of the time I just use that as a, a garage for the bike and then, uh, of course, this trip got a lot of rain, too, so I spent a lot of time underneath that cooking and eating and uh, doing some radio stuff and whatnot. So it worked out uh, It worked out pretty well. I also brought a bivy. That's a Soul Survive Outdoors Longer. What is that? An Escape model, uh, which is supposed to be breathable. It's uh, a little bit more insulated, yeah, a little more insulation and uh, a breathable material also and uh, I checked the waterproofness of it before I left I let water sit on it for like an hour and a half and it was not soaking through at all so it was pretty good but I went ahead and seam sealed it just in case uh, you know if I wanted something to roll out on a park bench or picnic table or whatnot just as a, a quick shelter I had that as an option too so between uh, between the tent the hammock uh, the bivy, and then I can also ground pitch the uh, uh, the tarp if I needed to and just sleep there on the ground. So I really had uh, four shelter options, which is good. So again, on, on, a, uh, on a long trip, you never really know what you're going to run into. So having options, uh, at least I like having options. Uh, that's a good thing for me. Uh, this is my chair. It's not really a shelter option, but I'll talk about it now. It's a REI Flex Light. I think uh, the current model is the flex chair, maybe. But uh, of course, you've always got to have something to sit on, and that's awfully comfortable. It's more like a recliner, so you know, if I'm sitting there eating dinner or want to lean back and watch the stars or whatever, it's uh, it's nice and comfortable. So that's it. Uh, oh, 550 cord, of course. Always got to have 550 cord. That's uh, my ridge line uh, when I string up the, the tarp. Um, I use it for uh, hoisting up the jumper dipole antenna for the, the ham radio. Uh, it comes in handy for all kinds of things. And again, you know, going back to the bike, just extra lashing cord. You never know what you're going to need. And there are so many different things you can do with 550 cord. And if you're not familiar with it either, uh, inside, if you get the standard 550 cord, uh, there's seven strands of nylon uh, string almost inside. And uh, if you need to sew something up, if you got a sewing kit, which I do in my first aid kit, it's kind of a first aid kit and uh, repair kit. But uh, you can open up that 550 cord and pull out those strands and you've got uh, all kinds of uh, thread there to use and smaller string if you need it. So very, uh, very versatile stuff. Moving along, the next up is my mess kit and food, all my utensils and uh, water and such. So the two stoves that I use, I've got a uh, Snow Peak, or I'm sorry, uh, yeah, Snow Peak Gigapower, that's what it is, little uh, canister stove, and uh, I've got an MSR Whisper Light uh, white gas stove. I actually prefer the white gas. 
over the uh, canister stoves. And uh, on this trip, I was a little hesitant uh, as to what I wanted to do for, for stoves and, and fuel. So between the two bottles, I've got uh, 41. I think the one is a 11 ounce and the other one's a 30 ounce bottle. So I got 41 ounces. I did the math on it uh, and I could get uh, with that amount, I was comfortable with about 11 days of fuel. And uh, this is an old stove. It's probably 15 years old or so. I got that early on when I was backpacking. It's actually uh, newer, though, than that uh, canister stove. Uh, but with as much as I've used that white gas stove, it, uh, it sputters a little bit. I've tried cleaning it. And uh, there's a, a cable that you can pull out of the fuel line that's... Uh, uh, to clean out the, I guess that's the heating coil on the top. It uh, That cable goes all the way down through there, but I've pulled that out and reinstalled that a few times and taken the stove apart, but it still uh, acts up every once in a while. So it's not, I, I'd say it's not 100% reliable. And, uh, you know, if uh, for as long as I was going to be gone, potentially up to, you know, three weeks or so, I was probably going to need to stop and get more white gas uh, for that setup. And uh, I got to thinking about it, and with as uh, uh, not super reliable as it is, I thought the canister stove would be probably a smart idea to take that along also. And uh, so that's what I did. I took both of them. And uh, to be honest with you, the, the canister stove was nice. I know you're not supposed to do it, but uh, if the weather's crappy and it's windy and cold outside, uh, I've cooked on the canister stove inside the tent before. I did that a couple times this trip. So again, like I said, is you're not really technically supposed to do that inside of a tent, but uh, I was careful with it. I was fine with it. But uh, yeah, it was a it was a good option. I actually had two canisters with me when I started. One of them was pretty well empty, and uh, then this one was mostly full. So uh, that also accounts for. Uh, you know, cooking on that every once in a while takes off some of the load of the white gas also. So I've pretty much used up uh, that entire 30 ounce uh, fuel bottle. So, you know, the, the times I did cook on the canister stove uh, certainly took uh, some of the use away from the white gas, which is nice. And uh, as far as resupplying on the go, too, the, the canister stoves are a little easier to resupply with. Instead of buying a whole gallon of white gas, you can just buy a, a canister. So just, uh, again, options. I like having options with everything. Uh, my pot set, it's an aluminum uh, Snow Peak set. I like Snow Peak stuff. It's been pretty good to me over the years. And uh, this is the, I want to say it's the 1400. I think they had a 900 and a 1400 model. And this is the bigger of the two. And uh, inside it, I've got a little uh, titanium uh, Snow Peak cup also. You could actually, uh, back in the day, I think you probably still buy these, but back in the day when I got this one, uh, there were two different options. One was a single wall and uh, one was an insulated double wall. And uh, I ended up going with the single wall because uh, you can cook on it. So you can lay that right on the stove and use that like a pot too, and I use that all the time. You know, if I'm only doing a single portion of instant oats or I'm doing a Easy Mac packet or whatever, you know, I just brew it right up in that cup. It works out fine. And I've got another uh, decent sized pot here. This one's a uh, uh, Soto, I think is the name on it. This isn't actually part of that Snow Peak kit. Obviously, it's something else, but uh, it fits down inside there, so it makes it nice to you know, have another pot for whatever. Most of the time, I use this one for boiling water and uh, making coffee and tea. That's uh, that's my go-to for my water pot. And then when I'm brewing up dinners, I use the the bigger pot. So whether that's a you know an easy mac dish or uh, one of these uh, Nora rice noodle type dishes. I, uh, I'll do one of those with a pack of chicken, one of these cans of chicken, or 
you know, maybe the ham or tuna or whatever. But uh, yeah, the the big pot is usually what I mix up dinner type stuff in. And uh, another thing I like doing is uh, pancakes. So I'm very fond of the Aunt Jemima uh, buttermilk complete. You know, just add water, pancake mix. And uh, let's see if I can find it here. Those are my packs of pancake mix. Pre-measured uh, three quarters of a cup in each uh, each packet. So it's uh, pre-measured. I don't have to you know, screw around with uh, measuring out uh, each quantity. But uh, what I do is I mix it up in this measuring cup here. It's, a, I guess, a one cup, a little more than one cup. And uh, I'll mix up half of one of those bags at a time and then uh, make up one bigger pancake. And while I'm eating that one, I'll make up the second one. Uh, I brought this skillet, griddle, whatever you want to call it, it's uh, magnesium, but this square skillet uh, works out fantastic for pancakes, and I cook eggs on it, bacon, all kinds of all kinds of stuff. This trip, I didn't uh, end up doing any eggs, but I had the uh, the yellow egg cartons or uh, six eggs a piece. But I didn't, uh, like I said, I didn't stop and pick up any eggs this particular trip. I should have, but. Uh, I passed a farm somewhere east of, uh, or let's see, that was west, southwest of Apple Creek, I think, had a sign that said farm fresh eggs. I should have stopped there and, uh, and picked some up. But uh, anyway, that's, uh, I guess, something to try for another time. But uh, this, I didn't actually take this with me on the trip, uh, but since we're talking about cooking gear and skillets and whatnot, uh, it's kind of a, a flat bottom walk. And uh, I've cooked up eggs and bacon and stuff in this before, but a lot of times I like uh, doing stir fries and pastas and whatnot. And uh, this being as deep as it is, it works out really good for that kind of stuff. But, uh, you know, with the, the trip and all the riding and stuff on this particular run, uh, I just didn't want to mess with chopping up the veggies and dealing with the, the actual chef-style cooking. So I kept everything a little bit more basic with the dried food and, you know, just heating up the chicken, the canned chicken and ham and tuna and stuff. Uh, as far as cooking oils and everything, I got Pam, butter, olive oil. So I use a lot of olive oil in the Easy Mac and the, the Nor Rice dishes. They call for vegetable oil a lot and that. I just substitute olive instead. Um, as far as breakfast type stuff goes, besides the pancakes, uh, Oats, instant oats. I like the uh, cranberry protein and uh, almond uh, Quaker oats. That's always one of my favorites. Uh, another thing I like doing is uh, cream of wheat. And what I do is uh, make packets of it in a quarter cup increments. Put a little bit of salt in it too. And then uh, I mix in a half a scoop of protein mix, protein powder, just the regular you know, protein uh, drink mix stuff that you can get in the health food section or uh, in the uh, in the pharmacy with the uh, supplements. I don't particularly like any of the uh, the flavored stuff, but this is vanilla. Uh, you know, I guess as far as the the different flavors that they have, uh, you can buy them uh, the chocolate and the vanilla in the in the real big uh, jars. So that's why I go with the vanilla. It's I guess of the flavors, it's the more mild one, I guess. Uh, I also put a lot of powdered milk in things, oats, uh, cream of wheat, uh, you know, some of those uh, rice dishes, uh, they, call for, uh, they call for milk. So I usually take quite a bit of uh, powdered milk. I've used up quite a bit out of that bag so far. So it needs to be restocked, but uh, yeah, I use quite a bit of that too. Um, let's see, syrup, of course, you got to have that with the pancakes. Uh, other drink mixes, I've got Tang, uh, lemonade and tea, just uh, whatever those country time mixes are. Uh, you know, those are good just for cold drinks, mix up. 
and uh, you have something flavored. Uh, also tea, I've got uh, mint, and the other one is a, an apple uh, cinnamon, just an herb tea, so it doesn't have any caffeine in it. But uh, I'm not too fond of the apple cinnamon stuff. I like the mint tea better. Uh, utensils, I've got uh, various spoons, forks, a couple of knives in there. Of course, my plate. And this is my insulated cup. I forget who makes that one. Uh, that's the Sea to Summit. That's a fantastic cup. I've been using that for, gosh, probably 10, 12 years. Uh, snack food stuff. I eat a lot of these uh, Cliff Bars. Uh, I like the uh, Gatorade uh, Energy Bars. Those are uh, those are really good. But I couldn't find any on this uh, on this trip. I had a couple when I started off, just from uh, before, but. Uh, I didn't find any on any of the resupply stock rounds I made. So I just got the Cliff Bars chocolate chips this time. Uh, trail mix, that's always good. Uh, going back to utensils and pancakes, I like a regular skillet or uh, spatula. I can't, uh, I can't deal with those uh, real small, you know, backpacking style ones. I, you know, give me a real spatula. So. I, uh, I take that one along with me. Uh, my camp knife, this is my favorite one for uh, uh, cooking, slicing up veggies, whatever. Uh, that's an SE3 and uh, blaze orange handle. I tell you what, you drop that in the woods, you can find it. That's, uh, that's one of the best things about it. But uh, I've got another SE knife, it's a, it's a six. So it's a, a big honking, almost a machete. And uh, I use that for splitting firewood sometimes in camp. But uh, on this particular trip, I didn't bring it. I just brought the, the three. I didn't want the size and the weight of the big one. So I just, uh, I just brought the three with me. That works fine. Yeah, I keep it sharp. Uh, let's see. As far as water goes, let's talk about water. Uh, I carry on a, on a normal day... Uh, my supply of water is three Nalgene, so they're what, 32 ounces a piece. So what, uh, I guess that's three quarters of a gallon. Close to it, maybe. But uh, yeah, so I carry uh, uh, three Nalgene's and then this uh, uh, Under Armour bottle. I don't know how many ounces that is. What's it say on it? Uh, I don't know, I'm guessing around 20 maybe, 16 to 20. But uh, you know, that's usually my water supply. Uh, on this particular trip, uh, I did run into a couple issues with resupplying on the trail. You know, a lot of the parks and uh, areas that you go through, they have uh, water fountains and such, but with COVID right now, like especially through Summit County, Summit County was a bear. Uh, they had boxes over top of all their water fountains. So when I was riding up through there, actually, uh, I got all the way up through the park and to the detour. And uh, I found uh, about three or four uh, Metro Park uh, service trucks on the, on the detour. They were doing uh, construction there. And for some reason, the Metro Park guys were just sitting there and you know, I rode up to them and just started talking to them and asked if they had any spare water. And uh, one of the guys gave me a couple of these small bottles just to get me by. So it was kind of nice. But uh, after that experience, uh, I started filling up. I got this gallon at uh, Walmart in Mechanicsburg. And uh, you know, I filled up all my Nalgene's and stuff with it. And I thought, you know, instead of throwing out that gallon, I'm just going to haul it with me and you know, it, uh, it might have come in handy. And, you know, again, after that Summit County experience, not being able to find water, if I did find uh, water along the trail, I'd even top off the gallon. So, uh, you know, a lot of times I'd have uh, that gallon and a couple of these other small bottles in addition to, uh, you know, the three Nalgene's and the, uh, the other bottle here. I, I'd have all that topped off. So, you know, if, if I fill all that up, that's 
for me that on this trip that was maybe i don't know three days three days supply of water which is good that uh that could usually get me through a, an off day and then uh, a couple of riding days so it worked out uh, i'm a big coffee drinker so i'll talk about coffee for a minute too i know uh, some of the people on the trail that uh that I ran into. Uh, they've seen this method now and hopefully they uh, they learn from it and can do it themselves. But I'll go ahead and talk about it here. Uh, so I just get, uh, I get ground coffee and uh, there's really not a whole lot of science behind it. I just put it in a bag, not really measured out or anything. I just use a spoon and, and divvy it up. Uh, but uh, going back to the, the pot I boil water in, uh, I get that nice and hot, and I use this bottle with the, the bottom cut off as my uh, percolator. So I use a, uh, a zip tie and uh, put that on the bottom, take a coffee filter, and uh, kind of wad it up a little bit, and then uh, close it down and, and lock it onto that spout with the, the zip tie. I'll just take my grounds and pour them right in the top there. And then once the water is hot and boiling, I just uh, pour that right in and just let it drip through. It's pretty much the same as pour over style coffee. And uh, it works. I mean, I, I make fantastic coffee with it. I've been doing that probably a good 10, 12 years. Not with that same bottle, of course, but I've, uh, I've done that method for a long time. Before that, actually, uh, I would take the, the coffee filters and I would uh, fold up coffee grounds in it almost like a giant tea bag and then staple it shut with a string but uh, anymore I just do the the pour over method uh, with the bottle so I don't know it's just my preference uh, you can try it either way the the big tea bag option is maybe a little bit cleaner uh, you know you're uh, you're brewing the coffee straight in the pot uh, with this method you know you can this is the uh, vacuum bottle I usually use for my coffee but you know if I'm brewing coffee I could just set that right in there and that's my that's my coffee machine so if I'm brewing up a lot of coffee if it's real cold I'll uh, I'll put coffee in the Stanley that uh, that will give me a nice supply for for a day but uh, this particular trip I didn't use the Stanley I just did the, uh, the Under Armour bottle there that uh, that was my go-to, and actually a couple days, I still had a little bit of coffee left in there that uh, I could reheat the next day, so it was pretty good. You know, that way you're not uh, messing around brewing coffee uh, right immediately first thing in the morning. But uh, you know, if if I had a little bit of coffee left over, I could just use the canister stove and that uh, that titanium cup, and I could reheat the coffee and have something to drink pretty uh, pretty quick. So it, uh, it worked out fine. Uh, a couple other things. Uh, oh, we're talking about water. I might as well talk about this too. This is my uh, Katahdin uh, 10 liter water filter bag. I'll go ahead and just get it out. Might as well, since we're talking about gear and gizmos. That's the filter itself. That's the hose, that's the bag. So what you do is uh, filter goes in here and screws on just like that. You fill this up. Again, it holds uh, a whopping 10 liters. Uh, but you fill this up and just hang it. And then you attach the hose to the bottom here. And this, uh, you know, that's what you fill off of. It's got this little click valve. Might as well get a little closer to the camera so you can see that, maybe. But uh, this is your on-off valve, so you squeeze it to, to close it. Then you pop that open, and that, uh, that opens it up. But this is a, uh, a double filtration system. So the main uh, filter that uh, purifies or cleans the water uh, is the one that's up inside the bag. I 
got mud on that from my trip. I got to clean that off. But uh, that is your main uh, purification filter. And then uh, I went one step further with this setup and the little black can that you see on the bottom, well, I shouldn't say the bottom, but the top of the hose, uh, this dude is uh, a carbon filter. You know, I don't really want to open that right this second, but uh, that uh, purifies the water even more. So if you have a little bit of discoloration in it, uh, if you have any kind of chemical taste uh, to the water, uh, the uh, the carbon takes care of that quite a bit, actually. It uh, it does work really well. The best thing about this, uh, the number one thing about this whole setup, uh, is that uh, you can just let the water filter through by itself. It's gravity-fed. I can remember uh, some backpacking trips back in college. A buddy of mine had uh, one of those pump-style uh, filters. And uh, I can remember, you know, we'd have maybe four or six people on a on a backpacking trip, and uh, I can remember stopping at streams, and uh, all of us would take turns running that pump, trying to fill up these uh, Nalgene bottles, and uh, that was a pain in the butt. I mean, that's just a lot of work to be doing that. Uh, you know, maybe some of the pumps are easier to uh, uh, to pump than others, but you know, that particular experience, I just, uh, I didn't really care much for the uh, the hand pumps. And uh, this gravity system has, uh, has totally transformed uh, my ability of getting clean water in, uh, in camp. So the drawback to it is, uh, of course, being 10 liters, if you're hiking uh, down from a, a ridge top to a, a stream down below, to, uh, to get water and then hiking it all the way back up to camp. Uh, it's a lot of weight, but uh, you know, if you think about it, uh, being able to have clean water to scrub dishes and brush your teeth with and, and drink, of course, it uh, you know, makes it really nice having that, uh, that quantity available. It's, uh, you know, it sure beats just a little bit. You can get out of one of those hand pumps and you know, maybe if you're toting around a couple of Nalgene's and, and that's your water supply for the night, you know, would you rather have uh, a couple of Nalgene's or would you rather have a whole whopping uh, 10 liters? I don't want to say at your disposal, but, uh, you know, it's just uh, you know, when you have that much, there's a lot more uh, peace of mind in camp uh, with being able to keep things clean and, you uh, have stuff to drink from and, and whatnot. So it works out pretty good. Uh, where'd my stick go? There it is. So a couple other things, uh, spices, uh, salt, pepper, of course, oregano, basil. I've got some uh, crushed cayenne pepper. I like the cayennes. They're uh, flavorful and uh, a little bit mild. It depends on how much you use. If you want it hot, you just put more in, right? But, uh, yeah, uh, oh, cleaning. Let's talk about cleaning for a minute. Uh, I've got a little bit of Dawn and uh, Camp Suds and uh, one of those scotch Brite pads. I use that for uh, scrubbing off the pan and some of the dishes sometimes if I need a, a real hard scrub. That uh, scotch Brite uh, really does a, a good job. Uh, I've got uh, orange, I think that's orange glow uh, hand cleaner with pumice. So if uh, I've got tree sap on my hands or, uh, you know, if I have to fix a chain or whatever, I got greasy hands, that stuff comes in handy. You can use it to uh, scrub off the skillet and pan too. And uh, I've got degreasing uh, hand wipes. Same thing. Uh, if I don't want to mess with you know, using up any of my water or whatever, uh, I can use these degreasing uh, hand wipes too. So again, options, that's, uh, that's the name of the game. Just, uh, you know, I don't, uh, I don't go out with, uh, uh, you know, very, very thin 
supplies, I go out with options and you know, being able to uh, deal with all kinds of things as they come. So that's uh, pretty much it, I guess. Uh, paper towels, you always have to have paper towels. So I'm trying to think, is there anything else I've missed? Uh, lunch food, I like to do uh, tuna and uh, Ritz crackers. I like the wheat style Ritz crackers. Sometimes I get them in the, the full length tubes or sometimes I get these snack size, uh, half length tubes. But uh, yeah, the tuna can go with a lot of different things too. I Sometimes I mix that in with the Easy Mac. You know, depending on how hungry I am, maybe I'll do one pack of Easy Mac and a pack of tuna or I'll do two packs of Easy Mac, you know, if I want something hot or, uh, you know, if I just want a quick lunch on the go, then I'll just slice open one of those tuna packs and eat it with some crackers. So let's see, I think as far as the mess kits, cooking supplies and food, that's, uh, that's about it for this section. So move on to the next one. So the next section here is my sleep system. We'll start with the uh, ground covers here. The first thing I put down in the tent or if I'm on the ground is uh, the blue closed cell foam pad. And uh, next up is a thermo rest inflatable. And uh, I have never had an issue yet, knock on wood, Hey, that is wood. Uh, I've never had an issue with this thing going flat, but uh, the theory with the blue closed cell foam is uh, if that were to happen, uh, if the inflatable were to go flat, uh, then there's always the foam to uh, insulate and uh, keep me off the ground a little bit. So it's kind of a redundant system options. Again, I like having options. Uh, plus, it's a little bit warmer. You know, you stack the, the insulating factors uh, of both the inflatable and the, uh, the foam pad, and it's pretty warm. Uh, my sleeping bag, it's a zero degree uh, north face. It's a super light model. Down filled, of course. You gotta have a down bag, not, uh, not synthetic. The down just works a heck of a lot better. And uh, inside of that, I use this fleece liner. I actually made this. I'm not much of a seamstress, but uh, I did actually sew that myself. But uh, that liner, uh, sometimes, in fact, I use the liner by itself if it's warm in the summertime. I just use this by, by itself as a, you know, just a, a very, very lightweight sleeping bag. It works fine. But uh, when it's cold, or if I'm using the sleeping bag regardless, I like using the liner inside of it because it acts like a sheet too. Then uh, I've got the option of, you know, if it's a mild temp, uh, when it's, uh, you know, when you start off the night, I may just leave the sleeping bag open and just cover up with the, the liner. Uh, as the night wears on and it chills off, I can throw the sleeping bag back over. Uh, so it's a, a really versatile system. I like it. It's uh, it's worked very very well. Uh, you know, again, about the past ten or twelve years, that's what I've been using. I got this uh, sleeping bag after my very first backpacking trip in uh, October of two thousand eight, and uh, it's been fantastic. I've I've been really really cold and stiff in the mornings. Uh, you know, without it. So, but with it, it's, uh, it's made a world of difference. In fact, even to be honest with you, even in the summertime, that's the only, uh, sleeping bag that I, I use is the zero. I'm, uh, quite the cold sleeper. So by, uh, you know, my philosophy, having a little extra insulation isn't a bad thing. Yeah. It might be a little on the heavy side, but, uh, you know, with the, again, the versatility of the liner plus the bag options. I've got a lot of options. Um, this particular trip too, I did bring the uh, camp pillow. 
that made it pretty nice uh, in uh, in camp. Uh, it didn't work out so well in the in the hammock because, of course, you're suspended and in, in a little bit of a uh, an arch position. But uh, when I was sleeping on the ground in the tent, that uh, that made a big difference. I enjoyed having that. And uh, this one you can compress and and roll up. So most of the time, I just stuffed it like that down inside the. Uh, uh, green stuff sack I had on the front lashed to the uh, the pannier and it worked out fine. I just put my first aid kit on top and some other things and just pressed it in there, compacted it. So it works fine. Uh, again, that's uh, that's pretty much it. I know we already talked about uh, the hammock and the underquilt for the hammock, but uh, I'll talk about that a little bit here too. But the the sleeping bag on top of that under quilt uh, for the hammock if I'm using that system uh, it's good you know down to negative 10 Fahrenheit I've, I've been in uh, some pretty cold weather with it in the snow it's uh, it's been just fine so again options with the, the combination of the liner and the sleeping bag uh, for me that uh, that works as a fantastic system Next is clothes, insulation, uh, gloves, footwear, etc. So we'll start uh, in the back with my shoe options. And these are my normal riding shoes. So just uh, inexpensive mountain bike uh, shoes with SPD clips on them, Giros. They were uh, relatively inexpensive when I got them several years ago. But uh, I switched over to the SPDs because when I started riding long distance, I was using platform pedals. And uh, all I could do was push on the pedals. And then that's what uh, developed my knee issues. So all the muscles and tendons on the top of my legs built up and it started pulling my kneecaps off to the side. So uh, after a lot of physical therapy to correct that, I switched over to the clipless uh, SPD system and that's been a lot better for me. So uh, the only bad thing about these particular shoes, they're uh, warm weather, they vent, uh, they're good for you know, riding uh, just that when it's warm, not when it's cold. Uh, I know there's a lot of different options of you know, putting bags over your feet or uh, putting your feet in bread bags over top of your socks and then putting the shoes on to, try and uh, keep your feet warmer. But uh, none of those really did a whole lot for me. I've always had uh, cold extremities on the uh, on the bike. So that's where these boots come in. Uh, these are my winter hiking boots. They're actually uh, snowshoeing boots. They've got the, uh, the mounts and uh, stuff on them for uh, attaching the snowshoes. But uh, they're fantastic to hike in. Uh, they're warm and waterproof. And uh, so I was trying to figure out a way of getting SPD clips on these. And uh, I had a lot of people on the trail <laughs> that uh, asked me, what in the world is that on your feet? So I had to show them what these are. In fact, uh, get these up a little closer to the camera so you can see them. They're just uh, pieces of aluminum that were shaped to the bottom of the shoe zip ties to hold it on and uh, it's kind of hard to see inside there but uh, the SPD clips uh, uh, the bolts go down through the aluminum and then there's a steel uh, almost like a backing nut underneath uh, that's threaded that those bolts go down into I've been using these uh, I came up with the design or the idea for them uh, last year so I rode uh, probably a good five or seven hundred miles with them already 
and uh, you know they they look goofy as all get out, but uh, you know they work fantastic. It's, uh, as stupid as it looks, sometimes it's the the stupid and odd and creative things that uh, that end up uh, working out. And I had the boots, you know. I had them. Why uh, why go out and spend three or four hundred dollars on a pair of warm cycling boots? They have the uh, the SPD mounts on them. So I just uh, made that uh, goofy contraption and it works fine, like I said. I also brought uh, my Keen sandals. If I was in camp and it was warmer and I wanted to take my shoes off, i just throw these on, but uh, it was actually too chilly. So I really didn't, uh, didn't use them a whole lot. Again, options, you know. Sometimes uh, if you're gonna be out for two or three weeks, you don't know exactly what the weather's gonna do and you know, you kind of hope for the best, uh, but plan for the worst. And if you've got the, uh, if you've got the gear, you should be fine. So moving on to uh, on the clothes, we'll start with the, the bike shorts. Those are uh, canaries, of course, uh, with a padded uh, chamois in there. So I always wore these. I've been wearing that uh, style of bike short for a lot of years. And then, and of course, uh, chamois butter, or uh, affectionately referred to as butt butter. Uh, every once in a while I'd use that. Uh, I didn't use it every day, but you know, if, I, uh, if my rear end was a little bit sore, then i put some of that on to try and help out a little bit. And uh, when it was cold, over top of the bike shorts, I'd have a pair of long johns on. Of course, everything really is synthetic. And then these are my uh, convertible uh, long pants and, and shorts. I've had these for a lot of years. But uh, I would wear these on the outside. And if you notice the belt, 550 cord again. I love that stuff. I use it for all kinds of things. But uh, that was my, uh, generally speaking, that was my outer layer. Uh, socks. I always wear wool socks. Uh, in the summertime, in the wintertime, sometimes I wear thicker ones. I had thicker ones with me, uh, which I never really used. I, you know, I was quite comfortable just with the regular socks and the boots. So that was uh, that was a good system for me. But uh, if it was any colder, of course, I had the thicker wool socks if I needed them. And sometimes even uh, I'll put hand warmer packets down there by my toes. Uh, but I didn't do any of that this trip. It wasn't quite that cold. I just, you know, with the regular socks and the and the boots, I was uh, I had quite happy feet. Uh, yeah, we'll talk about tops, I guess. So the first step on uh, on the shirts, short sleeve. Of course, again, all the stuff I was riding with is synthetic. So short sleeve uh, fluorescent shirt, a long sleeve fluorescent shirt. And then, uh, you know, depending on what the temperature was, I had a few different options. If it was really chilly, I could put the uh, fleece on. Uh, otherwise, most of the time, I just threw the uh, the windbreaker on over top of the uh, the long sleeve shirt. And that worked uh, for most days. But uh, you know, in camp, when I wasn't riding, of course, and not cranking out the heat, I threw the fleece on, and that uh, that gave me plenty of insulation. And again, most of the time in camp, I throw a, uh, a beanie cap on, one of those uh, Carhartt beanies that, uh, that usually worked out pretty well for me. Sometimes I throw uh, the second one on, the fluorescent one, just uh, to keep my head a little bit warmer. That, uh, that worked as a, a good system. As far as gloves go on my hands, uh, I think it's actually pretty common with cyclists that uh, uh, we get circulation issues in our hands from holding on to the handlebars all day, especially on uh, multi-day trips. And uh, I've always had, when the when the weather's been chilly, I've always had uh, cold hands, and uh, you know, sometimes I even get uh, uh, you know, my hands to, to stop working on me, which isn't any good. So gloves are uh, pretty important, and uh, this trip most of the time. The ones I wore are these uh, uh, cloth gloves, and uh, they kept the chill off 
for the most part. Uh, if it was really wet, I'd switch over to these. They're uh, Memphis Ninja Ice uh, work gloves. So they're, uh, they're insulated and they're waterproof. So they keep your hands warm uh, even when it's wet. Uh, if your hands do get wet inside too, the insulation, uh, again, it, it works uh, even if uh, you've got wet hands inside the gloves. Uh, the only thing I don't like about them particularly is uh, they are a little bit tight. They're a lot tighter than the, uh, uh, the cloth ones. And uh, you know, that, again, going back to circulation issues uh, and holding on to the handlebars, uh, I can only wear these for so long and then, uh, then I've just got to change out of them. So you know, if I'm, I'm doing a short ride around town or if I go out for the day, uh, I may start off in the morning with, uh, with those Ninja Ice gloves on and then uh, maybe after two or three hours I got to take them off. But uh, if it's really cold, what I actually prefer is uh, mitts. And uh, there's two reasons for it. One is uh, it keeps all your fingers together in the same department. You don't have the individual uh, fingers in the glove. And uh, second reason is uh, I also use the hand warmer packets in the mitts. So uh, by using uh, the mitt, again, with the ability of having all your fingers together and putting the hand warmer packet in there, uh, you concentrate all that heat uh, down where your fingertips are, not uh, near the, the palm of your hand or the, you know, the back of your hand. And, uh, you know, you still get uh, that heat down to your fingers. So it, uh, again, it, it works out a lot better for me. Yeah, you do lose the dexterity of your fingers. Uh, but at that point, uh, I would much rather have uh, the mitt style uh, hand covering and need to take it off uh, than to uh, uh, than to deal with the, the individual finger gloves. It's just uh, you know that's the way I am. I guess uh, works uh, it works best for me. So of course everybody's different. Uh, we'll move on to well talk about the boxers because. At night, when I change out of my riding clothes, I like putting uh, cotton pair of boxers on. That uh, uh, that helps me out. It's more comfortable to sleep in, I think. Uh, as far as my ring gear goes, this is my foul leather suit. That's uh, Cabela's Guidewear. So there's the uh, there's the coat, and then I've got the uh, the coveralls that go along with it. And uh, I probably lived in this thing. Easily, uh, you know, 70, 75 percent of my uh, 12 days out. This that's the way the weather was. So you know, it's uh, good for two things. Um, it's good windbreaker, extra insulation, uh, and of course, uh, if it's raining, that's the only thing to wear. So, uh, but with the temperature mostly, and you know, going in between periods of uh, drizzle and, and wet weather. Uh, most of the time, I would just leave the coveralls on, and then I would uh, I would put the uh, the coat on or take it off, depending on what was going on. A lot of times, I just ride with the uh, the windbreaker, but uh, you know, again, options. I've got uh, uh, plenty of options, and the theory with the uh, leaving the coveralls on is. Uh, you know, if they're on, I can unzip them and vent if I need to, to uh, cool off a little bit. Uh, but if I've already got them on, I don't need to worry about taking my shoes off and, you know, trying to put them on or take them off or whatnot. I mean, sometimes if the sun came out, it was warming up uh, a little bit more than, uh, than it was otherwise, then, yeah, I would stop and, and take them off because I had to. But uh, more often than not, I just, you know, I just as well uh, leave them on and uh, just uh, make it a little easier with my layering system just on the top not have to mess with the bottoms too much. Uh, let's see what else do I need to cover. Uh, riding at night, the reflective, I think that's a what they call it, a class 3 reflective vest. I've always, uh, always thrown that on at night just for a little extra visibility that never hurts. Uh, oh, 
for the occasion that I do want to wash up. Got a washcloth there and a uh, microfiber towel. So on one occasion, uh, I did stop at a laundromat, one uh, there in Apple Creek, and uh, I did two loads of laundry. I did the first load, so I'd have something to change into. Then I went into the bathroom and did a bird bath in the sink and uh, changed into my clean clothes and took my derbies off and did a second load of laundry. So, you know, again, options. It's not necessarily the uh, best thing to do or the most convenient thing, but uh, you know, with the weather the way it was and as cold as it was, uh, if it was warmer, you know, I could have done the same thing, just grab a bucket of water out of the stream and you know, take a, uh, a washcloth bath there uh, in the woods somewhere. But uh, it just wasn't uh, quite, the, quite the case with the way the weather was on the trip being as cold as it was. Um, oh, we talked about the gloves. We didn't talk about the balaclava. That's uh, a fantastic face covering. So if it's, uh, if it's really cold, I can put this on and uh, keeps my face a lot warmer. And uh, depending on how cold it actually is, uh, it may take the place of uh, one of the uh, beanie caps in and of itself. Uh, or if it is a little bit chillier, then I'll throw a beanie cap on uh, over top of it. So uh, with that system between the, you know, the, uh, the coveralls and the, uh, the gumby suit, I call it, with the gumby suit, the, the fleece, uh, the mitts, the balaclava, uh, the layering on the pants, all the uh, the shirts, and well, the bike shorts I had three of, uh, the fluorescent shirts I had two of, uh, the long johns I had two of. Uh, but if it uh, if it really got cold and I had to layer up uh, with the system that I've got, uh, I could easily get down to uh, the teens, maybe even the twenties Fahrenheit or let's see, the 20s, maybe even the teens in Fahrenheit. And uh, I, I'd still be able to keep on keeping on. So in fact, that's, uh, you know, the mitts and the balaclava and everything that's, uh, you know, come the, the end of the year into, uh, you know, November through say February or so. If I'm trying to get a couple of miles in riding, I'll call it the off season, but I still try to ride anyway. Uh, that's my normal system you know, when it's uh, when it's cold. So uh, again, options, that's kind of the name of the game. So moving on to maintenance, repair, and spare parts. So we already talked about uh, the spare tire a little bit, but this one has a wire bead and uh, so you can't really fold it, but you can loop it around and make it a smaller diameter. So that's what this is. It's always a good idea to have a spare tire with you, just in case you have a blowout, you, know, you tear a sidewall, whatever. Get that out of the way. And then uh, I carried two spare tubes on my particular trip. And uh, I did actually have two flats. And uh, I think they were both related because there was a bit of metal uh, after the second one, I, I did a real close inspection of the outside of the tire. Both times I, I checked the inside and didn't see anything that was uh, sticking through. But um, uh, the second time I, I spent uh, a little bit of time on the outside of the, the tire and I did find uh, some metal that was stuck in it. So I think the, uh, the two flats were related. Uh, so I used up my two good tubes. Uh, patching both of those flats. I didn't want to sit there and, and patch a tire or patch a tube uh, on the side of the trail or the side of the road. Uh, so I just put a new tube in after the, the tire inspection and then called it good. But uh, after the second one, uh, you know, I needed to uh, patch the two tubes that I had. Uh, and uh, the only way to, to really do that effectively is uh, to do it while you're in camp or you have an opportunity to, to sit idle. Uh, you know, if you're sitting there trying to make miles in a day and you get a flat tire, the last thing you want to do, uh, well, of course, the last thing you want is a flat tire, but uh, uh, if that does happen, uh, it's easier to throw a tube in that's good instead of, uh, you know, sitting there on the side of the road or the side of the trail uh, trying to find the hole in a tube and then patching it there. So 
uh, you know, I, I decided to take the time uh, both to, to patch uh, the two tubes and also I had some tears in the green uh, dry bag that is on the front of the bike. Uh, one of the extra ones that I lashed onto the side. Uh, I had some holes in that, so I sat there uh, with a little bit of duct tape and, and patched those uh, the holes in the bag at the same time. So that's uh, uh, that's always good. Uh, spare cables. I had one spare shifter and one spare brake cable. And uh, before the ride, actually, I went through and replaced uh, all the cables with new. Uh, so these were just extras and Again, I had all good cables uh, on the bike to start with. I didn't replace the sheaths, just uh, the inside cables. Um, as far as uh, the chain goes, I did actually on this trip, uh, I broke a chain for the first time ever. Uh, before the trip, I picked up two of these uh, quick links. And uh, oddly enough, that's, uh, that's where the chain broke is this uh, quick link here. Uh, so it didn't break uh, elsewhere along the chain. It was just that uh, uh, that quick link, which was good because it was, you know, I didn't have to break a link out of the chain that was broken to uh, to put another quick link in. It was just, you know, the, the one piece was uh, broken. So it was just a matter of putting in a new quick link and not messing with the, the pins on the chain. But uh, should that happen, uh, I do have a conventional uh, chain tool where you can press the, the pins in and out. And uh, I didn't have to use that though because uh, you know the quick links was all I had to uh, had to work with uh, fortunately and that was the only one that uh, that broke too. I, I still got a good quick link in there in case I need it later on. Uh, so that's it uh, for the chain. I do have a brook saddle if you're not familiar with those. Uh, they're a leather saddle and uh, there's a tension nut up in the, the nose of the saddle. And uh, I've had mine on there since I got the bike and that was, what, in 14, so it's uh, six years old, so I haven't really needed to adjust the tension in quite a long time. It's uh, well broken in by now, but uh, you never know. So I've got an adjustment wrench there for the, uh, the saddle if I need it. Uh, these multi, I'll call them multi-tools, uh, one's Torx and uh, one is metric uh, Allen wrenches. Uh, that doesn't go up big enough in size for the bolts on the crank, so I've got a, a separate uh, wrench for the, the crank. Uh, but those always come in handy, specifically the, the Allen wrenches. Um, I've got a couple of cone wrenches, one 15 mil and uh, a 13 mil. So on the last day, I did actually uh, adjust the cones on the on the front hub, I had a little bit of a wobble in the wheel. So I took everything off and uh, inspected it just to, uh, to see what was going on. And there was just a slight amount of play in the axle. Uh, you know, really not, uh, not all that much, but since I had everything off the bike and the tire off or the, the wheel, I thought I might as well go ahead and adjust it. So I did, uh, you know, it wasn't, wasn't very difficult. But uh, Moving on to the screwdrivers, I've got both a quarter inch drive and uh, that's got some bits up in the, the handle there. And then I've got the extra ones here, more Phillips uh, flat blades, uh, Torx. And then I've also got an eighth inch drive. So again, I'm carrying uh, various electronics too. So uh, some of these are so I can open those up, uh, Phillips. And then I've got some smaller uh, Torx and flat blades in here. Uh, so that, uh, you know, just in case I need it, that's there. Uh, I carry two multi-tools. Uh, this is a Leatherman, which has uh, a nicer pair of pliers on it. And then uh, my trusty uh, Swiss Army knife, the Swiss Champ, I think is what it is. It's got the corkscrew on there and a few other goodies. This one uh, has a metal saw on it. And uh, on either side of the saw, it's got two different grades of metal files. So if you need to uh, file something down, uh, that's, uh, that's a good tool to use. So I've used that for a lot of different things. Another thing too, um, going back to uh, cooking and uh, canister stove, uh, those cans only last so long and they're single use, you can't really refill them. Uh, but before you uh, throw those out or recycle them, 
even though they may not have enough fuel in it to run the stove, uh, what I always like doing is putting a hole in them so they vent and everything gets to dissipate uh, even more. And uh, there's an awl on this, which is kind of like a, a needle for uh, sewing leather, uh, but you can also use it for making holes in things. And uh, that's what I use to make a hole in those uh, canisters. So when I recycle them, they, uh, uh, they can vent. So that's a, a really good thing to, uh, to do. Um, let's see, I've got a spare cap for the headset. It's a compression style headset. And uh, before the ride, I actually broke the one that was on the bike. So I put a new one on and then that's, uh, uh, that's a spare just in case. I've got a couple of bolts uh, for the accessories like the racks and uh, uh, the fenders. So those go into your conventional brazons. Of course, uh, spoke wrench has got all three sizes, a zero, one, and a two. And then uh, pumps, we talked about those on the bike a little bit, but uh, I'll talk about them a little bit more here too. Uh, this is the Montrager Air Rush Road. I think it's a, a little older version. I actually got this the same day I got the bike, uh, which is both a CO2 and uh, a hand bump combination. Uh, one of the things I found about this one though is uh, the body threads into the head. And I had to use this on the side of the road, I don't know, about a year or two ago to uh, fix a flat. And uh, I didn't know it at the time, but uh, you have to have the body and the head uh, tight together for that to build any pressure. So it was kind of a nuisance uh, until I figured that out. I wasn't getting any pressure, but once I did, it, uh, it worked all right. And uh, just me personally, uh, I really don't like the pumps uh, that attach directly to the valve stem. Uh, no matter what the size is, I've got this one and uh, uh, for bikes that have a, uh, a Schrader valve on them, I've got another one that's, I don't know, maybe three times this size. And uh, I've used that one since I was running uh, BMX bikes back in the day. Uh, but all of these style pumps, I just, I, I don't like putting that stress and, uh, and pressure on the valve stem. That's just me. I know from a uh, compactness perspective and portability and you know maybe having a lightweight option on the bike, uh, these are attractive, but um, I'm just not a, a super huge fan of them. Uh, which brings me to this pump here. That's the uh, Topeak or Topic, however you say it, uh, a Turbo Morph Digital. Uh, so of course, you know, like I just said about the other pumps attaching directly to the valve stem, uh, this one has a hose, so it's a, a remote pump. Uh, you've got the foot peg on it. It's got a digital gauge, and you've got the handle that flips out. So it's uh, uh, it's a mini version of a floor pump, really, is what it is. And I use this one uh, so often now, I barely ever use the floor pump. And uh, this one, you can get up to, you know, my tires. The most I've ever really run is 83 PSI, 84 maybe. And, uh, you know, this pump doesn't have any trouble getting up to those PSIs. Uh, the only drawback to it, uh, well, really two drawbacks. Uh, the first one is uh, when you're pumping up a tire from, uh, uh, when you're pumping up a tire from zero to, you know, full pressure, uh, the pump can get hot. Uh, the other thing is, well, you know, going back to it getting hot, uh, a lot of people say that you should store these inside of a bag so that they're out of the weather. Uh, you don't get the road grid on them, et cetera, and you know, they, may, they may last a lot longer that way. Uh, but if the pump heats up after you pump it up, pump up a tire, and you set it next to something like these uh, zip tie bags, it might actually melt the plastic. It's, uh, it's actually surprising how hot that thing gets. Uh, but from a, an ergonomics perspective, too, uh, with as short as this pump is, uh, you know, if you're sitting there leaning over after a long ride and you know, you've got one foot on the peg and you're sitting there with both hands trying to put pressure in your tire, uh, being as short of a pump as that is, uh, you know, it's, it's kind of a, uh, you know, it's not the most ergonomic thing to use in the world. 
but again, it works uh, really well to pump up a tire, and I've used it uh, more often than, uh, than the floor pump I have uh, since I've got it. So uh, it's worked out uh, pretty well. Uh, we already talked about uh, patching the tubes a little bit, but again, I do have a patch kit in here. So that's, uh, that's definitely a necessity to have both that and spare tubes. So uh, I think that's about it for uh, maintenance, repair, and, uh, and spares. So we'll move on to electronics. This is probably a pretty popular section in the uh, gear talk here. But uh, yeah, there's quite a bit of stuff, lots of stuff. Uh, I do have another video, uh, the series introduction on portable power systems that talks about the, the solar power and the battery system. I still haven't found time to do all the rest of the sections. All these videos take a lot of time to do. So uh, I do have that as a goal to finish that series uh, because there is a lot of nifty stuff with uh, portable power systems. And, uh, you know, this, uh, this particular type of trip or, you know, backpacking, anything like that, it's uh, a perfect uh, opportunity to uh, make use of such systems. And uh, over the years, this is what I've used. We'll talk about it, I guess, just a little bit. Uh, but between both of those two solar panels, uh, generally speaking, in full sun, you're looking at about 17 watts. Uh, in fact, the highest I saw on, on this trip, uh, I did see over 20 watts, about 21 watts one time. Uh, but you know, generally speaking, about 17 is the most uh, that you can hope for in, in direct sunlight. Uh, so we'll talk about uh, the power system, and then, of course, there's a lot of nifty stuff here. We'll talk about the radio stuff in a little bit, uh, but we'll just start with, with the power. Uh, so again, the, the solar, if the sun is shining this particular trip, uh, I think I saw the sun maybe five of the 12 days, four of the 12 days. Uh, so I really didn't have a whole lot of opportunity uh, to get solar power, unfortunately. And that kind of brings me back to another idea I've had of uh, putting a hub generator or a wheel generator on the front, not necessarily a hub dyno. In fact, I want to stay away from those. Uh, they just put out too low a power for the, the amount of money that you're spending for them. But uh, if I can build something uh, somewhat modeled off of a homemade wind turbine alternator, maybe uh, have a few different size coils depending on, you know, if I'm cruising downhill, then what's a little bit more drag? So why not take advantage of it and switch in a, a higher wattage set of coils? Uh, so I've got a lot of ideas for that later on, but that's a whole other subject, I guess. But uh, every day, uh, the battery that I use to charge and run all my electronics is that dude right there. That's a 12 amp hour uh, lithium iron phosphate bio -NO battery and uh, I used to use SLAs again you can check out my my video on uh, portable power systems I talked about that a little bit uh, but the lithium really has transformed uh, the ability to run uh, electronics in a portable setting for me and uh, you know that's that's been a, a lifesaver uh, switching over to the the lithium uh, so as far as charging that system up, you know, let's go with the solar system for a minute here. Uh, the way that uh, the way that I get the most power back in the charge is actually to run the panels directly into the battery. Uh, of course, you know, if if the battery is very low on charge, uh, it's not you know it's not the worst thing in the world to uh, to do that to run direct into the battery. Uh, but as you do get higher in, uh, in voltage, uh, as that charge state increases, then you do really need to regulate that. Uh, that's what this little blue box is here. That's a, a voltage regulator or a charge controller. Uh, so it'll max out uh, somewhere around 14 volts, I think. I forget exactly what I have it set to. Uh, but once you get up 
in that uh, voltage, then it starts to pulse, so it doesn't uh, overcharge the battery. Uh, you know, that's again, there's a whole other uh, set of topics we could go off on with uh, with charging and, and power systems and whatnot, but I, I won't go into it in this video. Um, uh, different power cables. I like the power pole connectors. Those are the red and black connectors that you see there. Uh, I use that on everything pretty much. There's a 12 volt uh, accessory plug that I've got with a set of power poles on it too. So uh, this is just speaker wire. I want to say it's about 50 feet of it. And uh, I use that as an extension cable for the, uh, the solar panels. So uh, in one of my pictures that I'll show, I've, I've got the panels on the outside of the tent and then the battery and, uh, and everything on the inside. So I just ran that, uh, that extension cable uh, from the panels outside to, to inside. This brown cable has uh, three power poles on it. It's got two on one side, one on the other. Uh, so I'll use that to, to link the two panels together in different configurations. Uh, and that, uh, that makes it pretty handy. Of course, uh, you know, with the way the weather was this particular trip, uh, I did a lot of charging uh, being plugged into an outlet. And uh, that's what this guy is here. That's the, uh, the original uh, plug-in charger for the, the lithium battery. So uh, it came with uh, alligator clips on it. And uh, they would plug into this, uh, this here there was an alligator pigtail that went into it, then you clip it onto the battery. But uh, again, I like these power pole connectors. It's just very easy and convenient to uh, run everything that way. Uh, so I made an adapter to go from that round uh, coaxial style plug uh, to one of my power uh, cables here, that red and black one. And uh, I've got a couple of those. I got uh, another one in the bag over there, but uh, uh, that style plug, it works for a lot of different things. Uh, this is that uh, flashlight I mentioned at the beginning of the video. It's a uh, Phoenix. It runs an 18650 battery. So I've got the charger for that also. It's a, a lithium charger specifically for uh, like the, uh, the A123s and uh, 18650, etc. But uh, that uses that same style plug as, uh, as what this cable is. So again, versatility. Uh, the other thing that uses that is the Yellowcraft GX3 HF radio. I'll talk about that in a minute. But uh, of course, uh, you're never really going to be in a convenient spot to hit a AC outlet. So I've got one of these uh, GP lamp extension cords. It's got three outlets on it. It's not a grounded cord. It's just uh, hot and neutral. But uh, in the event that uh, I would have something to plug in uh, that has a grounded plug, I do have one of those adapters. Uh, you know, not really the best option, but it's small and compact. It's, you know, it's not adding a whole lot to, uh, uh, to the kit. So that, uh, that does definitely come in handy uh, more often than not. Uh, as far as AC power goes uh, in a portable setting, Again, I, you can check out my portable power systems video. I talked about this a little bit. That's a uh, 100 and, what is that, 140 watt power inverter. So I can run, again, here's my little adapter from power poles to a 12 volt accessory plug. But um, I can plug this together and run off that 12 volt battery. I can get 120 volts AC. Uh, so whether I'm uh, running the, uh, uh, the laptop computer, uh, I can plug that in and charge it. You know, again, you need to have solar power or, you know, another way of uh, providing power to recharge the battery. So, you know, plugging in if you need to, which I, again, I did a lot of that this particular trip. But uh, if you're out away from a power outlet and just running off the battery, you know, the power inverter uh, comes in handy, again, for running the laptop or uh, my electric razor that plugs into an AC outlet too, so I can recharge that on the go uh, if need be. So it uh, it works out pretty good. Uh, I already talked about the tablet and the bike computer. 
uh, in the beginning of the video, but uh, you know, those, uh, those are really the main uh, power draw that I have on this type of trip. Uh, even the, the ham radio stuff, I don't, uh, uh, I don't run that all that much, whereas the tablet and the bike computer uh, and my cell phone for that matter, which that's what I'm recording the video with right now, so it's not in the video because it is recording the video. Uh, but those are the, the biggest power draws that I have of, uh, of anything by far. So that's, uh, uh, that's what sucks down the juice. Uh, I also, on this trip, uh, brought a, it's actually a Garmin uh, dash cam. And uh, I've strapped that to my helmet before. I've done some uh, other videos of mine uh, where I've been cycling. And, uh, and that's the camera I was using for those. Uh, those video shots, uh, but with the way the weather was this particular trip, I didn't, uh, I didn't bother running the camera uh, really at all. So uh, just wasn't worth it with all the, the wet weather and, and such. I just didn't really want to mess with it, so I didn't. Uh, moving on to the ham radio stuff, um, I'll talk about the handheld first. Again, that's a Yesu VX6R. I mentioned that in the beginning of the video. It's a submersible radio, uh, both that and uh, the speaker mic. So it doesn't matter if they get wet. They, uh, they live outside uh, on, uh, on the side of the bike all day, every day, rain or shine. And uh, it's, uh, it's just been a fantastic radio. I've got two batteries for it. That's what... Uh, this dude is here. There's another one that's on the back of the radio at the moment. So, uh, you know, again, redundancy, backups, always a good thing. And then this is the, uh, the OEM drop-in charger. So uh, that'll work with uh, batteries off of the radio. Uh, or, you know, if I was stopped in a fast food restaurant or something, you can plug in. I just drop the radio in and, uh, and charge it. And uh, again, I, I brought the 12 volt uh, power supply for it. There is a, uh, an AC uh, wall plug that I have for it also, but I didn't bring it this trip. Because again, the goal was to, to run everything off of the 12 volts. So uh, as far as the handheld radio goes, uh, the main antenna, which this has been a, a really, really popular uh, question for a lot of people on the trail and in the forums and things that I've posted pictures of my bike of. Uh, but this is the antenna mount. Uh, that is the huge black pole on the back of my bike. Let's see if I can show you guys all the, the details of this. Uh, so this is a ground wire that goes to uh, the front of uh, the rear rack. So the, the brazons that are right underneath the seat, I just screw this on and that's an extra ground point. Uh, the antenna itself is a quarter wave, two meter ground plane. So both the, uh, the radiator, that's the vertical that you see here, and then each side of the ground plane is uh, about 19 inches, 19 and a quarter inches I think is what it is. Uh, so the ground plane is made out of 12 gauge uh, Romex copper, just solid copper, and then the radiator is uh, a TIG welding rod. I want to say that's, uh, what, 3 sixteenths of an inch diameter maybe? Either uh, 3 sixteenths or an eighth inch. But uh, it's really simple. I mean, you can make the same thing out of uh, coat hangers if you wanted to. So uh, pretty cheap. This, uh, actually on the top of this is a SO239 style mount. So it uses a PL259 uh, to attach to it. And the reason I did that is uh, it gives me a lot of different options of what antenna I want to use. These are uh, handheld antennas with a BNC. And then there's an adapter for a PL259. I can put a mobile uh, dual band whip on there if I wanted to. It uses a, uh, a PO style mount. It's all the, the same thing. And this uh, connector on the top actually is a, a direct crimp on to the coax. And the coax, let me move my shtick here. Uh, that's the 
coax cable here linking the radio and the antenna. Uh, but uh, there's no adapters up inside there. It's just that um, uh, that SO239 is uh, directly crimped to the cable and then it's epoxied in. So it's, uh, it's pretty strong in there. And this is uh, one inch PVC pipe, nothing fancy. I just painted it black and the idea was to uh, mount the antenna up high enough that uh, uh, when I'm riding the bike, it has no uh, interference with, you know, if, if I'm sitting in front of the antenna and that's the direction that I'm trying to reach out to or listen from, then uh, with an antenna down low, it attenuates. Uh, the higher you can get the antenna, the better off it's going to work. So that's, uh, that's the reasoning for the pole and, and why it's tall. Uh, another thing, too, is uh, being high, uh, it's an excellent spot to mount a tail light. So uh, in this particular trip, is it just a, a perfect example of it uh, in the hills when you get up around, uh, what is that, uh, Apple Creek and, uh, oh, not uh, Delmont, but... Uh, Anyway, Massillon, all those towns, when you're on the road sections, as you go up and over a hill and you crest it, by having the light up high like this, uh, people that are coming up on that hill have a lot further distance of warning that there's something up ahead uh, with the light being high as opposed to being real down low, uh, like on the back of the rack of the bike. It just, it, it makes a world of difference in, uh, in how far you can be seen uh, over the hills. So definitely, uh, uh, definitely a good idea to have the light up on there. Uh, as far as the mount, uh, this is uh, wall brackets uh, for shelving. Uh, I scrapped that uh, out of a building, I don't know, maybe six or eight years ago, and it's been sitting around it's just uh, yeah, maybe about uh, eighth inch and eighth inch uh, steel is bent and, uh, and shaped. So I just welded that together and uh, the sizing I came up with what the dimensions were is the width is uh, about the same as the top of the back rack and then the length of it uh, which you saw that in the, the beginning of the video uh, when I packed all the stuff on the bike between the mast uh, that's sitting back here in the seat uh, that's the distance of how wide uh, my bed roll is. So the, the blue closed cell foam pad and the, the thermo rest when they're rolled up, the idea was to be able to set those uh, right between the seat and the mast. And uh, it works fine. It's a, it's a great setup. There's really nothing uh, fancy with how the mast attaches to the bottom. It's just uh, a few zip ties. There we go again, zip ties are convenient, they're cheap. Uh, you know, if I happen to snag a tree branch or whatever and this thing got caught, you know, if you put enough tension on that, it'll just break the zip ties. So I did actually have that happen on this trip too. So another, uh, another reason to have spare zip ties. But uh, yeah, that's, uh, that's pretty much it for the giant pole that people ask me about in the antenna mount. Uh, I've got, a, again, a few different options of antennas. And uh, this one is a, a telescopic uh, handheld radio antenna. So that's it, all the way collapsed. And then, of course, it, uh, it extends way out like that. And of all the antennas I have, uh, the handheld style antennas, uh, this one is definitely uh, the best signal of all of them. And I guess that's pretty much a given with as long as it is. Uh, but these, if you're familiar with like the old style uh, stereo AM FM radio antennas that telescope, uh, they're not very durable. So that's the number one drawback to this. And that's why I don't like using it a lot because I don't want to, uh, I don't want to damage it. It is already messed up a little bit, but uh, the less I use it, the longer it's going to last. So. Uh, that's why I don't uh, particularly use it all that much. And uh, as far as antennas go, uh, it's a lot of times, especially in the hills, it's hard to beat a quarter wave vertical. So 
uh, sometimes it's the simple stuff that uh, uh, that works the best. So that's uh, that's the reasoning for the welding rod quarter wave vertical on top of Romax 12 gauge copper wire. So it uh, it works. It's a great antenna. Hey, um, moving on to the HF setup. So uh, I guess we'll talk about the radio first. Uh, that's an Elecraft KX3. This one, uh, I did add the two meter module to it. Uh, so this does all bands uh, 160 through two meters, including six meters and 60. And uh, just an absolutely fantastic radio. In fact, I would even say of all the receivers, uh, even my bigger desktop radios, like the Kenwood TS-2000, uh, the receiver in this radio is uh, absolutely amazing. I'd say it's, uh, that's easily the best, the best receiver of all the HF radios that I own. But uh, max power on it is, uh, what, 12, somewhere between uh, 10 and 15 watts, uh, which you have to have the voltage up on it uh, over, I want to say 13 and a half is about where the cutoff is. But uh, if you're running on battery power and you key up and the, uh, the voltage sags, uh, then the power automatically drops back to 5 watts, which is QRP. So uh, you know, most of the time, if I'm running portable, then I'm usually running 5 watts. Uh, this particular trip, uh, I ran a lot of 40 meters, and um, with that, I would drop down to 3 watts. There was a time uh, you know, early on, well, let's see, maybe, I guess that would have been, what, 4 or 6 days into the trip. I took a day off, and uh, I had the antenna set up and was running 40 meters with some guys back home. And uh, I was running 3 watts and uh, getting back no problem, so... I even dropped it down to one watt just to experiment. And uh, just, you know, for a, a comparison of power, a uh, typical handheld uh, like this one here on uh, 2 meters and 70 centimeters, it'll do 5 watts. So you look at the power of a handheld and then you look at this radio running HF at even just 1 watt. You know, I was talking uh, several hundred miles uh, just as clear as day. So it goes to show you the power of uh, shortwave and uh, also what propagation conditions can do also. Uh, so as far as uh, the different modes, this one does pretty much everything. It's got the, uh, the built-in, uh, well, I mean, you can take it off, but it's got the built-in uh, Morse code key, the iambic paddle here. And uh, for voice, of course, the, uh, the microphone. And then I've got a, a bunch of other accessories in here. This is another uh, power cable splitter for the power poles and uh, adapters for the RF connectors, PL259s, uh, SMA, BNC series adapters, gender changers, all that. Um, as far as antenna options go for the, uh, the HF side of things, uh, the, the main antenna is this uh, jumper dipole, which is uh, really these three coils. So you have each leg of the antenna are these uh, coils. And then this is the feed line. It's 50 feet of LMR 100, which is an RG174 size coax. So it's really small stuff. It's uh, great for portable uh, QRP type uh, operating. And uh, the antenna itself, uh, this does all bands. Uh, at the moment, it does all bands 6 through 80 meters. And the way that I built this is it's a full-size dipole on every band. So you start at 6 meters, you tune it for that, then you add 10 meters to it, 12, 15, 17, 20, and so on. Uh, but what's also a little bit different about this design is on, uh, on 40 and 80, I actually split those bands in two parts. Uh, so it's resonant both on the high side for sideband, uh, and it's also resonant on the low side uh, for CW and digital. 
Uh, so I have the option of, uh, you know, depending on which jumper uh, that I set, I can, uh, I can set it for either the high side of the band or the low side uh, when you get down to, uh, to 80, and, uh, 80 and 40. So at some point, um, this particular antenna, uh, I'm going to expand out to 160 meters also. Uh, I haven't decided if I want to uh, split that band into two sections or three sections, but you know when I get to it, I'll, uh, I'll cross that bridge when I get there. Um, all the white pieces on it, they're actually uh, uh, chunks of a cutting board. So I just got one of those big, uh, I don't know if it was like 18 by uh, 22 inches or whatever it was, size cutting boards, and cut all the pieces out. So those are my uh, insulators. And then this is my uh, center feed point. So, you know, it's uh, just homebrewed uh, home brewed ingenuity and, and nothing uh, overly fancy. Uh, it is a complicated antenna build just because it has so many bands and you have to be very careful with how you tune it on each band. Uh, but once you go through and, and do all the effort uh, to put it together, uh, you've got all the bands in it, no tuning required. You know, if you want to change bands, you just drop the feed point a little bit, get to the jumpers and connect up and disconnect whichever ones you need. Then you pull it back up and you're on the air. So it's, uh, you know, for a, for a camping antenna or portable, whatever, it's uh, absolutely fantastic. So we've got that one. Uh, and then I've got a bit of wire here also that if I want to, uh, another thing about the KX3 is it has a built-in tuner. Uh, it's a real wide range matching tuner also. It's not your typical uh, three to one matching range uh, that you see in a lot of their radios, uh, but they actually have a, a wide range uh, matching internal tuner uh, that you can get for that radio. Uh, so I've got some wire here that I can set up uh, a random wire antenna with, and then uh, counterpoise. I've got two different options for how I connect that to the radio. Uh, just a simple positive negative uh, BNC binding post, or uh, I've got a one to one ballon uh, that I made in this box. So just with uh, wing nuts, you know, positive and the ground side. Again, that's a one to one ballon. So just uh, depending on what I want to do. Of course, the, the random wire antenna that's. Uh, that's a little easier to set up than the uh, uh, the jumper dipole is, but as far as efficiency goes, and you know, the, being able to reach out and uh, and talk to places, man, this uh, that jumper dipole works out fantastic. Uh, going back to uh, coax, an RG one seventy four size uh, cable. This is uh, an extension I made. It's fifty feet, so I've got a male BNC on one side and a female on the other. So if I need to uh, set the antenna up that's further away from where I'm trying to operate than the uh, the 50 foot feed line gets me, I've got uh, I've got 100 feet of feed line that uh, that I can put on if I want to. So that gives me a lot of options. Um, as far as getting the antenna up, again, this is the the center point. Uh, how I set this up usually is an inverted V configuration. So uh, the feed point is uh, the high point, and then just like a, an A-frame style tarp or a tent, you drape the, the sides off, kind of sloping down uh, towards the ground at angles. So uh, you really just have the, the one uh, support, if you will. So uh, to get that up in the air, uh, that's what I use the slingshot for. So I've got a slingshot and a fishing sinker, and then uh, this is 15. I want to say it's 10 or 15 pound test uh, monofilament. So I'll throw this uh, up over a tree and then uh, once I get the, the sinker down to the ground then I'll hook on uh, 550 cord. There we go again. 550 cord it comes in handy for a lot of things. Uh, and then I'll, uh, I'll pull the 550 cord up with this and then on the other side of the 550 cord uh, is what I attach the antenna to because there's no way the, uh, the fishing line would hold up that antenna. But uh, I actually want to switch that fishing line out for uh, something like Power Pro. That's, uh, oh, 
can see there's Spectra or Dyneema, one of those real strong fiber uh, type lines. Uh, but that stuff is more durable than is uh, monofilament plus monofilament. Uh, as it ages, it gets brittle, which that stuff is. So I'm surprised it actually lasted through this trip. But uh, yeah, the, the Dyneema or the Spectra style uh, fishing line would definitely hold up better. Maybe get something around, I don't know, a 50 pound test. It'd probably be uh, around the same size as that 10 or 15 uh, pound test monofilament is anyway. So that's, uh, that's it for the HF stuff. Um, I think I talked about that a little bit, but I've got uh, uh, alligator jumpers in there and some spare wire uh, just for connecting things. Case in point, actually, uh, this connection. So these uh, these solar panels are like bumper stickers almost just with a solar panel top on it. And these uh, black strips on the side, uh, you have to scrape off that material and then that's your uh, either your positive or negative depending on the side. And uh, I had one of these soldered connections that ripped off uh, early in the trip. So I was using a alligator clip jumper to, uh, to make that connection to the last panel here. That way it was, uh, it was still putting out the full amount of power. Otherwise I would have been down, uh, one of the panels. And that's, uh, you know, especially with not getting a whole lot of sun this particular trip, that would have been a, another downer, so to speak. Uh, what else do I have to talk about electronics wise? Uh, I think that pretty much covers everything. Again, uh, I wouldn't normally take a full size laptop, uh, especially on a backpacking trip, but uh, you know, I was going to be out for potentially up to three weeks. And uh, you know, when I'm browsing the internet, I like using uh, a laptop a lot more than I do the phone. So that's uh, that's just me. I, uh, I preferred to take it, so I did. Um, you know, yeah, it is a little bit more weight, but uh, you know, for, uh, for what I do and the length of time I was going to be out, it, uh, it just worked out to take a uh, laptop along too instead of just a phone. So, and again, power inverter. I can run the uh, AC adapter for the laptop off of that which I did one day, so it, uh, it works out uh, pretty well. You know, you combine all the different things and yeah, it's a lot of gizmos and gadgets and you know, a lot of people uh, would look at it and say, you know, why the hell would you take all that stuff with you? But, you know, that's part of the adventure and part of the fun and that's, uh, you know, just the way I roll, I guess. So that's, uh, that's about it for the electronics. This is the last but not least section of the gear talk. This is some miscellaneous and uh, extra stuff that I carried with me. So we'll start off uh, with the fly fishing stuff. I did take a, a fishing kit with me. So I've got a mix of some streamers and dry flies and wet flies. And uh, the rod itself is an Orvis uh, four weight and uh, four piece pack rod. It's uh, pretty compact when you, when you consider uh, what it is. And uh, the reel that I brought is uh, an old hardy English made reel. It was my grandpa's back in the day. And uh, it worked out pretty well. It's uh, I've used that for a lot of years. A couple of different reels, but uh, yeah, this particular trip that hardy is the one I ended up bringing. Um, as far as uh, these yellow tent stakes go, uh, the little aluminum ones, the uh, Shepherd's hooks or whatever you want to uh, call them. Uh, they're not quite as strong as what these yellow ones are. And I thought if I needed to pull up a, uh, a ridge line or do something that needed more tension on it than uh, what I could get with those aluminum tent, uh, tent stakes, uh, that's why I brought those yellow ones. So I didn't actually use them, but uh, again, options. I always like having options and that's, uh, that's why they were there. Uh, I always like carrying uh, a folding saw. That's a silky saw. It's their Gomboy model. 
and uh, I got onto those quite a few years back from uh, some of the guys on the Backpacker Magazine forums. And uh, at the time, I was looking for a, a collapsible saw to size up some firewood. And uh, that little uh, Swiss Army knife that I showed here a few minutes ago, uh, it does have a wood saw on it. Uh, but when you're talking firewood, it, it really is uh, a far cry from uh, what you could really use. And uh, so I ended up uh, going with a, a silky saw, a smaller model than what this one is. And uh, then I upgraded uh, from that one, which was about a three and a half inch blade, uh, to this one, which uh, is closer to 10 inches, I want to say. And uh, it works out a lot better for me. So as, as far as firewood size, I can go up to about a four inch diameter. And uh, it works just fine cutting through there. So uh, you can actually process decent wood with it. That's, uh, that's what I like to do in camp. Uh, I did bring a candle lantern too. I don't know if you've ever seen these, but they're pretty compact uh, little lanterns. They use those nine hour emergency candles. But this thing just pops up and uh, then you can hang it from the hook. I've used these for years in my tent. I know you're not supposed to have a flame in a tent, but hey, it, uh, it works. It takes the edge off and I like the light in the evening. So as far as the temperature, you know, it warms up the tent a little bit. Again, going back to that uh, mountain hardware tent, being a, a cross between a three and a four season, it holds the heat in a lot better than uh, uh, than a conventional three season tent with all the mesh. So that uh, yeah, acts as a good light source, a hand warmer, kind of to boost the temperature in the tent a little bit too. So it's nice to have, I think. Uh, carabiners, you always have to have carabiners for lashing stuff and attaching things to the to the bike. You saw that with all the grocery bags and the uh, the spare tire I had uh, that was zip tied shut and then used a carabiner to attach it to the rest of the stuff that was on the back of the bike. So they, uh, they come in handy all the time. Uh, the big black trash bags, I've got several of those just as extras. Um, you know, if you need a uh, another uh, repair to the ground cloth of the tent or uh, a mat or something to set underneath the uh, the hammock, uh, or to uh, to put extra gear in, you know, like the uh, the utensils and my cup and plate and stuff like that. Um, I originally just had that in uh, those white uh, uh, grocery bags, and uh, with the rain coming, I ended up uh, putting them all inside one of those black trash bags, and then inside the white bags. Uh, just kind of a, a little redundancy and, and trying to keep more of the rain out. So, uh, you know, the bags come in handy for all kinds of things. I do have a lighter that uses uh, butane. So I've got an extra uh, butane bottle to refill the lighter. And uh, that did come in handy. I needed to refill the lighter a couple of times, actually. So glad, uh, glad I brought that. Uh, buckle straps, of course, for tying on stuff on the back of the bike or the front, for that matter. Those always come in handy. And uh, a little bit of uh, bourbon, that's always good. Thanks, Dan, for the Knob Creek. That's a 120 proof single barrel Knob Creek. Pretty good stuff. So that's the first time I'd had it. Um, of course, with all the rain and the clouds and whatnot this trip, I didn't need it, but I do have uh, sunscreen. So I don't turn into a lobster. Uh, let's see what else here. We'll move into the uh, the toiletries. Of course, your toothbrush and mouthwash, and I've got a bar of soap in there and some shampoo. And then uh, I've got my electric razor in this one. And uh, again, going back to the power system and uh, the power inverter. If I need to charge up the uh, electric razor, I can plug that in and and charge that up too. So. Uh, another reason to have the, the power inverter. Uh, Q-tips, I got a pair of tweezers and fingernail clippers in there. Uh, this is my first aid and uh, gear repair kit. So I've got uh, sewing stuff in there. I've got a thimble, needles. Uh, I've got some more duct tape in there, of course. That always comes in handy. Uh, Band-aids, gauze, I got what... Uh, allergy medicine in there. I've got ibuprofen, uh, 
butterfly sutures, just a, a lot of stuff. Uh, an ace bandage, just in case I have a you know, leg muscle or something that goofs up or I got a knee issue, I can wrap it. Uh, a teepee, extra teepee. I had uh, a little bit uh, in my head or uh, handlebar bag at the beginning of the trip and I used it up and then I had a whole new uh, fresh roll. So and I've used uh, close to half of that uh, on the trip. So that, uh, that came in handy. Uh, wet wipes, baby wipes, these always come in handy. Uh, back in college, I started uh, using those when I was backpacking as kind of a backwoods bush shower. So you can scrub down with them. Uh, I find them even easy to use for uh, cleaning out pots. So after dinner or breakfast, you use those to uh, to wipe out pots and kind of do your dishes with. So, you know, just uh, a very versatile uh, thing to have, I think. Uh, the headlamp, of course, you always have to have a headlamp. I've got the light on the bike. That's uh, my flashlight. Well, in fact, I stuck it back in my pocket because it's my everyday carry. Uh, but a flashlight is good, you know, for all kinds of things. But uh, the headlamp, when you need to use your hands and see at the same time, there's nothing like having a good headlamp. Uh, moving on to the helmet. In fact, I should have talked about this um, when we were doing the uh, the clothes and the insulation and jackets and coats and rain gear. Uh, but I got this, uh, I guess it's a rain cover, if you will, or a helmet cover, uh, just before the trip based on a recommendation from uh, one of the guys on bike forums. And uh, this is actually a, a really slick uh, contraption. Uh, pretty inexpensive, or sort of like, I don't know, 10 or 12 bucks. But uh, it's waterproof, so it keeps the, you know, if it's raining, it keeps the top of your head dry. Uh, but the nice thing about it is uh, it covers up all these vent holes in the helmet. So when it's chilly and you've got uh, a lot of air flowing through there, uh, your head can get pretty chilly. So, uh, you know, instead of using uh, the beanie caps, uh, you know, a lot of times, most of what I wear, actually, again, I should have talked about this when I did the insulation, but I use these uh, earmuffs like that, and then I can put the helmet on on top, and uh, that combination between these and the, uh, the helmet cover uh, works out really well for most of the conditions I was in. Uh, again, if it was a little cooler or I wasn't warmed up for the day and it was first thing in the morning, uh, then I'd have one of those beanie caps on, but uh, aside from that, the uh, the cover uh, certainly made a uh, made a big difference. So uh, I also bought before the trip. I wasn't sure how this is going to work out, but uh, I got one of these uh, gel seat covers. So uh, the saddle that's on the bike is a uh, uh, Brooks a Flyer Special with the springs on it. You can see. And, uh, of course, being about six years old now, it's a, already broken in. It's really well broken in, I should say. Uh, but I thought, you know, if I was riding day after day and my butt got sore, uh, I'd try this and, and see how it worked. Uh, but it does actually add quite a bit of height to the, uh, to the saddle. And uh, the times that I did try it, uh, I didn't adjust the saddle height, which I probably should have. Uh, but overall, my opinion of it was uh, I didn't really like it all that much. So, I mean, if I got to the point, which I didn't, but if, if I did get to the point where my butt was so sore I could barely sit on the, the hard uh, leather saddle, even with the chamois and the bike shorts, uh, I had this as an option to, to try at that point uh, to see if I could get a few more miles in it. Again, didn't really use it, but uh, it's, uh, it's there if I need it. So something else to try, I guess. So I think that about wraps up uh, all of the gear. Again, I'll, I'll talk about the stick. I guess I'm holding on to it, but uh, I ended up cutting this uh, when I was at the, the last camp. But uh, it's just a, a forked stick, and you can use it right there on the top tube as a, a stand, or uh, you, know, you can put it around the seat post if you want to. So. It just uh, makes it really nice. 
again, I started doing this uh, instead of the fishing rod case because uh, this was a little bit too short. And that's how I got all the holes in the bag. But you can see that's uh, what maybe a good eight to ten inches longer the um, the stick is anyway. So it worked out pretty good. I had to make a few cuts in it to try to size it up right. I also put a taper on the end of the stick if you can see that. So that way it uh, it poked into the dirt a little bit better and it uh, it held in there. So that's uh, I guess that's it. So thanks for. Uh, tuning into the gear section and uh, if there's any pictures again I haven't really figured out what I'm going to title this video but uh, I'll go back in and edit things and you know if there's any pictures I want to post in there uh, after all this I'll throw them in there as well and, uh, and we'll go from there.